Well, you picked a good day to be here at CCC because, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we have a special guest with us today. His name's Don Hamilton, and Don comes to us from southern Pennsylvania, Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, where he was a senior minister of a church up there uh, uh, for 38 years. He was a senior minister of that church, 40 years total in vocational ministry. Yeah, that's no small task. 38 years as a senior minister. He's the father of four daughters, seven grandchildren, and one of his daughters, Andrea, who's here today, she actually, when CCC was practically brand new, she actually was a resident with us for about two years, I believe, and we actually wanted to hire you, but we didn't have any money, Uh, (laughs) but she did just fine. She went on and served in the kingdom, beautiful ways, and just like his daughter, Andrea, Don loves to travel, like loves to travel. And I'll tell you one of my favorite uh, travel stories about Don. This kind of tells you a little bit about his heart here. Uh, He took a sabbatical some time ago from leading his church. And as part of that sabbatical, he hiked across Spain like you do. All right, now check this out. It was this 500-mile Camino Way in Spain known as the Way of St. James. I don't know if any of you have, have ever heard of that, over three mountain ranges. But he didn't just hike. He didn't just take a walk. In doing so, he raised more than $40,000 to start a new church and children's center in Bolivia. All right? So he, it was phenomenal. He's the author of a book, a soon-to-be-released released book on leadership, and he's authoring another right now. He actually consults with churches and nonprofits. He does a weekly inspirational blog article. You can actually check it out on his website, donmarkhamilton.com. But mainly, here's mainly what I want you to know about Don. This is what I actually love most about him. He is just a very humble, humble servant of God's church and God's kingdom. And anytime I've been around him, anytime, I am so encouraged And I hope that you're encouraged today, too, because we have him here with us. Would you give a warm CCC welcome to Don Hamilton? Well, thank you, Dave. Appreciate it very, very much. I'm not sure I'm the guy that you introduced, but whatever, I'll take it. (laughs) I'll take it. I am really honored to be here today. I mean, sincerely, I I have followed this church for years, and um, as David said, my daughter Andrea worked here, and and you survived her, and uh, (laughs) I've survived her a lot longer, so. Uh, But um, I've always highly respected David, great leader, great man of integrity, and you guys have a great church family. So I'm going to share with you this morning some... um, Three kind of principles uh, that feed into something that I learned years ago and that I've kind of practiced my whole life, and I know they work. So I kind of hope that they work for you as well. Well, you know, after I retired a few years ago, I decided at one point, well, Hamilton, what are you going to do with your life now? I'm not a guy who go play golf every day and all that. And I decided I, I still wanted to make a difference. I still wanted to be a part and people for years had told me, Don, you ought to write a, a book, some books. Um, you got some stuff you could put in books. Well, I just never felt like I really had time to do that. So I'm sitting in my chair thinking, well, you do now. <laughs> you got no excuse. So I started writing, got really, really excited, book on leadership. And, and I thought, man, three months from now, I'm going to have me a book. It's going to be finished. And then I'm going to get me a a publisher and an editor. Another three months, I will be able to get on Amazon and buy my own book. I'll go to Barnes & Noble and just sit there and stare at it, you know? (laughs) Well, three months turned into three years. Three years. And uh, still not released, should be very, very soon. But I did, uh, about a month ago, went to my mailbox Got something that was really cool to me, and, um, and it's a review copy of this book. Lead Like a Bodyguard, 52 Timeless Leadership Lessons by Dr. Don Mark Hamilton. There you go. <laughs> so I finally got it. Thanks, thanks. 
Um, but can I tell you something about this book that is also a life principle that is so true? Anything you do that's significant in life, anything that's really worth having, that you really need in life, I can tell you something. The vast majority of times, it's going to take longer than you ever thought it was going to take. It's going to cost you more than you ever thought it would cost. Not just money, but that's part of it. And it's going to be harder work than you ever thought it would be. And because of that, because significant things in our life end up being like that, we can get discouraged. We can want to give up sometimes. This is taking too much time. This is costing me too much. I don't want to do all this work anymore. But I learned something years ago that if you reframe these three situations in your life, if you look at them differently, you will learn that during that period of time, God is doing a work in you. And it's a precious gem. It's priceless. That work is he's building in you character character and it's worth all the time all the cost and all the energy to get character god wants to make you a person of great character he wants to make me that way god uses people who possess great character and he'll take the time to develop it inside of you you know friends you can be the wealthiest person on the block but if you don't have character you're not really wealthy you know, you can get accepted to a prestigious university, go through the whole course, get that piece of paper on your wall. But if you don't have character, that piece, that, that ain't worth the, the paper it's written on. It takes character. You can become a CEO. You can be a COO. You can be a successful entrepreneur. But if you don't have character, you're really not very successful. You can sing like an angel. Maybe play concert piano, but if you don't have character, all that talent really comes to naught. Character is something that we need to develop in our lives. You know, character is what makes a person stand up for what's right, even in the face of all kinds of opposition. Character is what causes a person to show kindness and compassion to somebody when they know they're not going to get anything in return for it. Character, it per perseveres through all the difficult times and not compromising its values or its ethics and not complaining about it the entire time. That's character. You know, character treats everyone with respect. Doesn't matter what gender, what race, creed, even people that vehemently disagree with a person. When they have character, they still show respect for a person. Character is doing what's right when nobody's looking. Character, it tells the truth when a lie would be so much easier. And character, folks, is the bottom line. Character is what makes a person practice what they preach. And God wants you to have it, and he's developing it in you. But there's a catch to it. In order to grow character, you have to have resistance. That's how you get character. Reminds me, I've been a weightlifter most of my life, and <clears throat> one thing you learn about lifting weights is that you've got, to, um, you've got to lift that resistance, lift that weight, and you have to do it until that muscle is totally exhausted, and you just can't lift anymore. And you know what happens over the next two or three days? A miracle happens in your body. That is, your body takes protein, and it starts rebuilding that muscle. Except when it rebuilds it, it makes it stronger, and if you're younger, it makes it bigger. <laughs> if you're not younger, it makes it this, you know? <laughs> Resistance. More time than you want. Costing you a lot. Man, is it hard work. But that's how you build character. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to a church in Rome many years ago. And, uh, and there's a part of that where he describes this process of building character really, really well. Let me read it to you. It's Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. 
Paul says we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. For we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. It makes us hope. When you have character, you're always hopeful. That's what makes you get up the next day and do it again. Because you got character. You got character because you endured the resistance, the time, the cost, the work. God gets things done. I want you to know he really does. He gets things done through people of character. And he wants to do that through you and through me. You know, there's a a character in the Old Testament, a very famous leader. His name's Moses. Very early in the Bible, it tells the story of Moses. And Moses' life actually is a good illustration of this process. So let me share a little bit with you about what the, the life of Moses. It starts out as a baby, and Moses miraculously ends up in uh, the household of Pharaoh of Egypt. As a matter of fact, Pharaoh's daughter, daughter adopts him. And, um, but actually, uh, Moses is a Hebrew. He's not an Egyptian. And at that particular time, the Egyptians had enslaved the Hebrews for years and years and years. Meanwhile, in this first 40 years of Moses' life, he's growing up in this household. He's got the best education. He wears the best clothes. He's got the best food. He's got a whole He's got a whole stable full of cool camels. He has got it all. But he didn't have to work for any of it. He just got it. He didn't have to work for any of it. Well, finally, he gets to middle age. He's about 40 years old. And for some reason, something kind of starts churning in him. On some kind of unrest. And it keeps going and going in his spirit until it's keeping him up at night. And finally, Moses comes to realize he knows that he's a Hebrew. He's not an Egyptian. And he's laying there one night maybe and says, you know, here I am in this Pharaoh's palace. I've had this my whole life. And here my people are out there suffering day in and day out. And I don't even know what it's like. So he decides that he's going to go find out what it's like. Maybe he can do something about it. He goes out the next day. He starts walking among the people, and he was utterly appalled. The conditions that those people were living in was ten times worse than he ever could imagine. He keeps walking. He comes across across an Egyptian taskmaster. This taskmaster is just beating this Hebrew, beating him mercilessly. And you know what happened? This churning wells up in him. Moses is also a guy that's got a temper on him. And he has a profound sense of justice. Something snapped. I'm going to do something about this. He waits till everybody's gone, thinks he's alone with this taskmaster. You know what he does? He murders him. That's a temper right there. He kills him. He kills him, buries him in the sand, goes back home. I wonder what he was thinking in bed that night. You think he felt guilty? I doubt he ever killed somebody before. Do you think he said, man, you let your temper get out of the way again? But there's still something in me. I want to help my people, and I'm going to do it. So he gets up the next morning, starts the same process. Except today, he runs across two Hebrews who are fighting with each other, these two guys. And he's like, what is up? Why are you guys fighting with each other? This is ridiculous. You should be fighting the Egyptians, not each other. Well, one of the guys that started the fight, he's kind of a smart aleck. He says, well, who made you Lord and judge over us? And then he continues, you're going to kill me like you killed that Egyptian yesterday? Moses' jaw drops to the ground. His eyes get as big as silver dollars. I've been found out. And news like this travels fast. And if this gets all the way up the food chain to Pharaoh... I'm in big trouble. Guess what? It got to Pharaoh, and he was in big trouble. Pharaoh comes after him to kill him. Moses have to get, has to get out of Dodge just as fast as he can. 
He goes 180 degrees away from him, about three or 400 miles, heads towards the Red Sea, goes around the Gulf of Aqaba, ends up in a place at that time called Median, which is probably Saudi Arabia today. He's gone a long, long ways. Now, this is a guy who's middle-aged. He's grown up in all this household. He has no uh, purpose in life. He's a fugitive. So he sits down beside a well, take a break, get a drink. While he's there, these seven women come up to the well, and they're trying to draw water, obviously, to water their flock of sheep. Well, while they're there, this group of shepherds come up, and those shepherds run them off. And you know what happened to Moses when he's sitting there? Ooh, he got sense of justice. This ain't happening. He gets up and runs those shepherds off. And it's not shepherd, it's shepherds. This is a bold guy. He is a bold guy. He calls the women back over. He gets the water for the sheep, actually waters them. So they go back home to their dad, dad named Ruel. Ruel says, he says, girls, what are you doing home so early for today? Which tells me that this probably happened a lot. And uh, what we, dad, we met this Egyptian guy. And he ran the shepherds off. And then he actually watered our sheep for us. Ruel was like, wow, well, wh where is he? Didn't you invite him to dinner? Well, no, we didn't think of it. Well, think of it. Go find him. So they do. Go find Moses, invite him to dinner. And around that dinner table that night, something really marvelous happens. This, this group of people, including Moses, just kind of clicked. This family clicked. They liked Moses really well quickly. So Ruel says, you know, Moses, I could use another shepherd. How about you come to work for me as a shepherd? Moses thinks for a minute, oh, well, I got nothing else to do. So he does. He becomes a shepherd. He also eventually ends up marrying one of the daughters named Zipporah. And you know how long Moses ends up being a shepherd? It's the second 40-year period of his life. 40 years. 40 years tending sheep. And, you know, I think, you know, God knows why all, all this is going on. He knows why back in Egypt he, he had this churning in his heart, this desire to help, this desire to save. But I can see God thinking, you know, Moses, someday I'm going to call you to something really big, really, really big. But it's going to require more of something that you don't have right now. That something is character. Moses, you don't have the character to do the big job that I want you to do eventually. So I think I'm going to let you tend sheep for 40 years. And while you're tending those sheep and you're learning all those principles to take care of flocks of sheep, someday you're going to apply those same principles and you're going to shepherd a flock of 2 million people. Now God knows all this. Moses doesn't. So Moses just being a shepherd. Well, what's a shepherd do? <clears throat> shepherd gets up in the morning and takes the sheep to get something to eat. Shepherd gets up in the morning. He shears the sheep. Shepherd gets up in the morning. He makes sure they get water. He makes sure, gets up in the morning. He protects the sheep. He gets up in the morning. He makes sure the sheep are having lambs so the flock's still growing. All those things that a shepherd does, all of which will apply later. Well, Moses' 40 years came, went by, gets to the end of 40 years, and Moses is on Mount Horeb. He's probably brought his sheep there to pasture. He looks out ahead of him a little ways, and he sees a bush, and it's on fire, and it's, but it's not burning up. He piques his interest, so he draws, he gets closer to this bush. He's standing there in front of this bush. Guess what? The bush starts talking. I don't know about you, I'm out of there. <laughs> Either that or I'm thinking, Hamilton, you've been smoking way too much wacky tobacco. <laughs> well, immediately, it identifies himself as God, an angel of the Lord. And the first thing he says is, Moses, Moses, I'm here. Moses, you need to take your sandals off, buddy, because you're standing on holy ground. Moses says, Okay. Takes the sandals off. God says, Moses, you remember that little thing that happened back in Egypt all those years ago? Oh, yeah, I remember that. I've been trying to forget it for 40 years. 
well, you know, I'm going to send you back to Egypt. I'm going to have you go before the new Pharaoh of Egypt. And you're going to tell him that you want him to let his, those people go. Those Hebrew people are, are my people and your people. And I want you to free them. And then I'm going to have you lead those people. Well, Moses says, you got the wrong guy. And I ain't going back to Egypt. No way. Well, now, Moses, you're going to go before Pharaoh, and you're going to be like a god to him. You're going to work some amazing things because he's going to resist you until finally you just overcome his will and you will lead these people out of slavery into freedom. That's what you're going to do, Moses. You've got the wrong guy. Why in the world would you pick me in the first place? No, you're going to go. What? But I can't talk. You know, I could never talk in front of Pharaoh. I stutter, I get tongue-tied. No way I could do it. Moses, who made your tongue? He keeps making excuses. He finally just kind of starts arguing with God, which tells me once again, this is a bold guy. It takes some chutzpah to argue with God face to face. He does. Finally, God gets a little irritated with him. He says, Moses, you are going to Egypt. And here comes your brother Aaron. Aaron, you know, is a great public speaker. He'll go with you. You'll be like a god to Pharaoh and he'll be your prophet. Okay, we got that? You, you on? All right, I'll do it. Signs on. He gets his family. He goes back to Egypt and he goes before Pharaoh. This is a bold fella. Sense of justice. And he tells Pharaoh the message that God has given for him. And this whole thing ensues that goes on for a little while, which is very difficult until finally Pharaoh says, you guys need to get out of here. Moses ends up leading those two million or so people out of Egypt. And, <clears throat> and he's done this absolutely marvelous, marvelous thing. Well, the, the thing that Moses didn't know that he could never know was that he was going to pay a much bigger price than he ever guessed. It's already taken more time than he could ever have imagined, but God's developing this character in him the whole time, day after day after day. Now it's going to cost him because the people that he's leading are the whiniest, complaining bunch of people you have ever met in your life. Every day they whine about everything. They complain about everything incessantly. They blame Moses all kinds of stuff that he didn't do. They blame Aaron for all kinds of stuff that he didn't do. They even get to a point, they say, we want to go back to Egypt. We would rather be enslaved than we're going to die out here in the desert. You know how, how long? He, he's working with a stiff-necked, hard-headed group of people, and they're relentless. And because of that, God says, I'm going to teach them a thing or two as well. So for the next last 40 years of your life, Moses, you're going to lead this group of people around the wilderness and the desert. Well, that's a fun job. Day after day after day. And Moses is going to witness his entire generation die. Nobody left. He's going to see all of this. Well, you see, God's doing this because years and years ago, to their ancestors, God had promised that one day they would be brought out from an, a faraway nation and that he would give them their own land, their own promised land, he called it, for their possession. So Moses finally gets to the end of this time, and he's right up to the precipice of going into this promised land. And God has told him, he said, Moses, you're not going in. You will not take these people into this land. Your protege, Joshua, will do that. But you see, by now, Moses is a guy of character. God, whatever you want, I know it's best. My time is up, and I need to move on. God takes him up on a mountain. He lets him see a lot of that promised land, and then Moses dies, and God buries him. Folks, 
over all those years, all those years, Moses became a man of character. 120 years of this. God developed that. Folks, can I tell you something? Anything significant in life, anything that's really worth having, is going to take longer than you thought it's going to take. It's going to cost more than you thought it was going to cost. And it's going to be harder work. But God is doing in you during that time something priceless. You are getting character. God loves character. And God uses people of great character in great ways. That's what happened with Moses. Well, you know, much later in the Bible, a writer writes a little synopsis of Moses' life, kind of like, almost like a memorial service would be. And he writes uh, what Moses was really like in a, a summation. Let me read it to you. It's, he says, it was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to his great reward. Remember, character make, gives you hope. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. Why? Because he was a man of character. Those 120 years of Moses' life, God was up to something in every 40-year segment, just like he's up to something in your life and in my life right now. And can I encourage you, when you, when you get frustrated, when you get discouraged because of how much time and cost and work it is, you can take one or two paths, really. You can get angry. And you can go let your anger turn into bitterness, make everybody miserable around you. Or you can become a victim. Whoa, it's me, it's taking too long. Or you can do what a lot of folks do. You can just quit. You can just give up. Or you can take another avenue, another path. That path you, keeps going. And it keeps going because you have reframed that picture and you know that in that process, God is doing a marvelous work in you. One that pays off more than anything else you could seek in life. And it'll take a lot of time. It'll cost a lot. And it'll be hard work. But can I tell you, don't take heart. Don't let the discouragement overtake you. Don't become angry and bitter during this process. And don't give up. And you won't give up because you know during this time God is giving me something that is priceless and I'm going to work with him on that. Through all of this, you will develop character and character is a priceless gem. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we are very, very thankful that we could be here together today. It's been such a great time and uh, Lord, we pray that we've just honored you and will continue to. Father, we, um, we look to this subject of character, and, and Lord, we do realize it's a very difficult um, thing sometimes to gain it. And um, so, Father, I pray that for all these folks here, that uh, if they're in one of those times of discouragement, Lord, that you'd encourage them, let them know what you're doing through them. And Father, we just ask you that you would make all of us people of great character, and then use us in great ways. Father, we're confident that this will happen, and we thank you and praise you for it ahead of time. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>